Let's talk about not you, the buyer, but me, the seller. I am the producer, the business person, the manufacturer. What do I do if I'm producing peanut butter and I see the price of peanut butter starting to rise? Well, if, if the prices are going up and I sell peanut butter, I can make more money. And I can afford to cover higher costs if I need to, to do that in order to grow more peanuts. I have to buy more fertilizer or whatever, okay? So, what we see is this. That when the price of a product is fairly low, let's draw it in here. If the price of a product is pretty low, as a seller, I may only want to produce 10 of them because I'm not getting a real high price. But as the price rises, what happens? If the price goes to $5, I might look around and say, wow, if I get $5 a piece for those things, I could afford to produce more, grow more, transport more. And so maybe in that case, I will produce, I don't know, picking numbers again, 33 units per week instead of 10. So now we're up here at this point, see? We went from point A, a low price, not a whole lot offered for sale. A high price, more offered for sale, B. And maybe if the price went to $10, I'd be saying, well, I'd like to produce a lot of those things. And so I would be producing, oh, I don't know, 58 units per week. And so I'd be up here at point C. And so now we have the opposite of the demand curve, if you will. We have a positive sloped line, which we call the supply curve. And listen carefully the way I'm going to say this. The supply curve shows us the amount sellers will offer for sale at each price. The demand curve showed how much people would buy at each price. Now we're seeing how much sellers will produce and try to sell at each price. And we know as the price goes up, it gives them incentive to produce more products. There's no guarantee they'll sell it. But if they believe they can get a high price, they tend to produce a lot more product. And as they see that price, in, in fact, uh, happen, uh, you know, they're producing like crazy. Uh, think about this just for a minute. If gasoline, which uh, at the time I'm making this video, if gasoline is $3.80 a gallon, and then gasoline goes to $7 a gallon in the United States, our usual reaction is as buyers, oh my goodness, that's terrible. But as sellers, what would you be thinking? Well, part of your thinking is people need it pretty bad, they're going to keep buying it. And if I could start selling it at a higher and higher price, would I be willing to go out and explore and find more oil fields and, and build more refineries and produce more gas? Well, sure, it's more profitable. So, high prices, a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends on where you are. It depends on whether you're a buyer or a seller. Now, when we put all this together, by the way, and we move along the supply curve, from one point to another point on the supply curve, that is not a change in supply. That's a change in the quantity supplied, the quantity offered for sale. When you move along the supply curve, it's because the price changed. And that's not a change in supply. It's a change in the quantity supplied. What then is a change in the quantity demanded? I'm sorry, in the supply. What does a change in supply look like? Well, a change in supply is a shift of the entire curve. Maybe it goes out here. What this says is that at whatever price that used to be, people now are willing to supply more. They're willing to create more product. At every price, reading down here, the quantity supplied is increased. What would make sellers increase the amount they produce at any given price? And there are five reasons in there. And we'll do it very quickly, okay? This is a change in supply. The whole supply curve moves, maybe to the right, maybe to the left. If it helps, do this. When you see the word supply, just append right at the end of it the word curve, okay? Supply change, supply curve changed. The whole curve moved, okay? If the whole curve didn't move, just the price changed, you moved along the curve, that's a change in quantity supplied. You can do that with demand too, okay? When you see the word demand, if you're not sure if the curve is, is moving, put the word curve after the word demand. There was a change in the demand for gold. There was a change in the demand curve for gold. The whole curve shifted to the right or to the left, depending. So, what kind of things can make the supply curve shift? One, 
number of sellers. Two, sellers' expectations. See, that's very close to demand, the same kind of stuff. Number of people selling it, any change in their expectations. But what else? Three, the cost of production. If I'm making, if I'm growing watermelons, and I find some magic new seed or fertilizer or technique that on a given piece of ground, instead of growing 100 watermelons, I can grow 400 of them. Okay, what am I going to do? Man, I'm going I'm to grow a lot more watermelons and try to sell them. Okay? If I'm producing, uh, I don't know, skateboards, and I find this new wheel to put on it, and the wheel, instead of costing me $15, costs me $4. That reduces my cost of producing those skateboards, so I can produce a lot more of them for the same price that I have been charging and make a lot more money. So when I can reduce the cost of producing something, the supply of that product is going to increase. And very closely allied to that, we use technology as another force that can increase supply. And in, if, to me, it's easy if you think about it. Technology typically means decreasing costs of production or becoming more efficient. Now, the fifth one's a little messy up here. What else can shift the supply curve? It, it's the price of other products. Price of, look at my term, Substitutes in production. Okay? If I'm growing wheat on my farm and I see the price of corn go crazy and I can also grow corn, what am I going to do? When the price of corn goes up, I'm going to say, why am I growing wheat? I start growing more corn. So an increase in the price of corn caused me to produce more corn, but now I'm producing less wheat. And so there's a decrease in the supply of wheat. It just occurs to me, I left off the fifth one about demand a while ago. You know what it is? We had what? Number of buyers, expectations, tastes and preferences, incomes. What was the other thing that changes the demand curve? And the answer is the price of other goods. Other goods meaning either substitutes or complements. And let's do that just for a second. If I'm producing Ford trucks, Chevy trucks are a substitute. Okay? So if I'm producing Fords, and the price of Chevrolet's drops, what am I going to do? Hmm? I'm going to see a lot of people buying Chevrolet's. What's going to happen to the demand for my Fords? It's going to fall. If the price of Chevrolet's goes up, what's going to happen to the demand for my Ford trucks? People are going to look at those Chevrolet's, some people, and they're going to say, that's too expensive. They're going to start buying a Ford. So with the demand curve, we have substitutes where the price of one increases the other if it increases, or if the price of a substitute falls, it decreases the demand for another. We'll go through those in depth. And then we have complements, two goods that are used together. If the only way you'll eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is with peanut butter and jelly, those things you buy or use together, we call them complements. Suppose you love peanut butter and jelly, and the price of peanut butter goes to $50 a jar. How much jelly do you want now? When the price of peanut butter goes way up, we can't afford to buy peanut butter and jelly, so we don't need as much jelly. Okay, Those are compliments. When the price of one goes up, the demand for the other falls. You want to be clear on those relationships. Okay. Now, the last point is, of course, when we draw all this stuff together, and I'm, I'm doing this very quickly as an overview because I presume you have a textbook which pretty much tells you the same thing. But maybe you're more comfortable if you can at least see it once. Oh, almost live. How's that? If we had a supply curve, that curve color's not very good. If we had the supply curve for a product and the demand curve for a product, we have to ask. Okay? If the price started out up here really high, this is uh, watermelons, and watermelons are selling for $15 a piece, and people are saying, oh my goodness, I don't want to buy that expensive a watermelon. Well, at this price, we read to both curves. First the demand curve, but then we also read over to the supply curve, and we say, what's going on? And we see that from the demand curve, this is the quantity people want to buy, the quantity demanded. But from the supply curve, the sellers at that high price, man, they're bringing out a lot of watermelons, they're trying to sell them. And the price is so high that 
we have a surplus. Okay? The sellers can't sell all their watermelons. What are they going to do? And the answer is they're going to start cutting the price, moving down the supply curve. What do we call that? Is that a change in supply? Uh, it's a change in the quantity supplied. It decreases. They're going to find themselves with so many watermelons, they need to sell them just to get rid of them. As they begin to decrease the price, what do buyers do? Buyers see watermelons are getting cheaper. So they start buying more watermelons. Is that a change in demand? No, it's an increase in the quantity demanded. And so what's happening, these things are moving closer to each other. The quantities are getting closer to equal. The surplus is shrinking. And you're being driven, the market is driven towards the intersection of supply and demand, equilibrium. Okay? And that's the way markets are supposed to work. They always move towards equilibrium. Just for a quick second, suppose the price started off at $1 for watermelons. At $1, read across. First to the supply curve. Sellers say, man, for $1, I don't really want to produce a lot of it. There's no money in it. There's no profit in it. But buyers are saying, man, for $1, I'm going to get happy on watermelons. Now my quantity demanded here is very high. I love watermelon. It's cheap. But what's the problem? People are trying to buy more watermelon than sellers are willing to sell. And so now we have a shortage. We don't have enough watermelons to go around. And sellers aren't stupid necessarily, right? When they see a lot of people looking for watermelon but the, the shells are bare, they begin to raise the price of watermelons. And as watermelon prices go up, sellers say, well, at those higher prices, what? I'll increase the number I produce. Is that a change in supply or a change in quantity supply? Quantity supplied. You're moving along the curve. The price is bringing up the level of output. But at the higher price, buyers are saying, eh, for those kind of prices, I don't think I need as many watermelons. Thank you very much. That is a decrease in demand. Okay? And again, they're moving towards each other. The difference between the amount purchased and, and available for sale is decreasing, and they're moving towards equilibrium. And so we say in markets, the markets always move towards equilibrium. There's no direction by government here, right? Nobody's telling the market what to do. This is individual buyers and sellers trying to get what they want. And so the market moves towards an equilibrium, and at equilibrium, what's going on? At equilibrium, the amount people want to buy, the quantity demanded, exactly equals the quantity supplied, and bingo, you're done. Until what? Until one of the curves shifts. The supply curve increases. The, or, sorry, the demand curve increases, or the supply curve decreases, and your equilibrium goes to a new level. And when that happens, you wind up, well, let's see if we can do it here real quick. If the demand curve went up here, here's your new equilibrium. But here's where you're operating. If the market was here at equilibrium, we say, uh-oh, at the old price, we now have a shortage because people want to buy this more. It's become more popular. What's going to happen with that shortage? Well, the same thing that happens with any shortage. Sellers are going to see the opportunity to raise price and therefore produce more. Buyers seeing the price rise are going to say, I don't need quite as many. They're going to decrease their quantity demanded. Then the market's going to move towards another Equilibrium. It's a really nice, simple, almost elegant system, the way it works. People who believe in free markets love this. People who don't necessarily believe so much in free markets or see problems with it, they say, well, this is a really good model. How long does that take? And what happens while there's a shortage? And what, is it, what if this is a shortage of water after a hurricane or a typhoon? For a while, you're going to have a shortage there. Are you just going to wait until that price rises and eventually we move to a new equilibrium? Well, there could be people out there dying of thirst. Or a shortage of some sort of uh, medicine. What, do you just let the, the market move? How long does it take the market to, to adjust and, and uh, you know, adjust to the new, new equilibrium? So we'll get into those arguments later in economics, but those are the basics behind the supply curve, the demand curve, the shifts, and the changes in equilibrium. Okay? Make sure you got them down. Bye.